The year was late 2018. Disney was rolling out the marketing campaign for The Nutcracker in the Four Realms, and leading actress Kiera Knightley made an appearance on The Ellen Show to talk about the movie. Now, the movie itself was... Then I'm the queen of the castle, and you're a dirty rascal. Not great. But I want to draw your attention to this particular moment in the interview where Knightley talked about some other Disney movies, and not in a positive way. And uh, she's banned from seeing certain uh, children's movies, right? Yes. What are they? I really like the film, but, uh, but Little Mermaid. I mean, the songs are great, but do not give your voice up for a man. Hello. <laughs> wow. And I find it revealing that this is the takeaway she got from Disney's Little Mermaid. Obviously, film is subjective, and people can have whatever opinions they want. But those arguments have to be supported by the text in question. For example, I disagree with people who believe that the fantastical elements in Pan's Labyrinth are all made up by Ophelia. But those people's arguments are based on and drawn from different parts of the film that they had interpreted differently from me. That is totally valid. Hearing Knightley's words, I have to wonder if she even watched The Little Mermaid, because let me tell you something about this movie, it is not how she describes it here. Let me tell you something else about this movie. It's good. It's really goddamn good. And I'm tired of seeing it get dumped on by bad faith internet critics. I'm making my stand here, because I'm about to give you my passionate defense of Disney Animation's The Little Mermaid. When the film opens, we see a ship, and on board is Prince Eric, who hears about the supposedly mythical merpeople that live beneath the waves. And sure enough, far below the surface is the Undersea Kingdom where we meet King Triton, Sebastian the Crab, and see all of Triton's daughters presenting a grand musical number. All of them, except Ariel. Ariel is off exploring, scavenging sunken human ships for priceless treasures, like a a common kitchen fork. Have you ever seen anything so wonderful in your entire life? But I mean, come on, how can you not find her excitement over mundane objects endearing? At this moment, though, a shark attacks them, and two things happen that very subtly characterize her. One, as they swim away, her bag of trinkets gets snagged on this thing here. So she swims back for it even as the shark is angrily chomping her way. It shows that she can be rash and disregard her own well-being. However, later in the scene, her friend Flounder gets knocked out. And what does she do? She immediately drops her bag to save him. So while she might be careless with her own well-being, she is not careless with others' well-being. And I think this achieves a very delicate balance. A character that can be foolish, but not annoyingly foolish. After all, she's a kid. And we see that play out more when her father reprimands her later on for missing the performance. Speaking of her father, let's focus on him a bit. A major change this film makes to the source material is that, in the original fairy tale, mermaids aren't actually prohibited from going to the surface. In fact, it's expected that each mermaid, once they come of age, goes to the surface to see something really cool and then come back to tell everyone about it. But the writers of the film changed it so that King Triton has a harsher prohibition on being exposed at all. After their altercation, though, he sits back, and starts to wonder if he went too far with his words. Do you uh, think uh, I was too hard on her? This is an important element here. His intentions, a desire to keep Ariel safe, are positive. But the film sets us up to question if his methods are too harsh, and whether he's doing more harm than good. This will come up again later in the movie. He tells Sebastian to spy on Ariel to keep her out of trouble, and this is how the crab ends up tagging along to the girl's grotto, which is filled with treasures from the human world. And this is where my understanding of the movie begins to diverge from many other people's interpretations. Ariel's infatuation isn't with a man, it's with an entire culture that she is forced to exist outside of, that she desperately wants to know more about. And it's the smallest, most mundane things, the items we take for granted, that she's most in love with. I don't see how a world that makes such wonderful things could be bad. She wants to dance, jump, walk down the street, find out more about human culture, actually see fire. Notice that what she doesn't mention at all in this song is getting a man. That's not her motivation. 
Her greatest want and need is to experience the world humans live in, to know what this magical surface life is like. Honestly, I feel like this film pairs well with the documentary Paris is Burning. For those who don't know, Paris is Burning is a 1990 documentary about queer culture in New York City. Specifically, ball culture with its drag queens and houses comprised of young people cast out of their birth homes for being transgender or gay. Howard Ashman, the film's songwriting producer, was a gay man living in New York City at precisely this time. I feel it's not a stretch to suggest that this idea of a forbidden yet liberating culture influenced him and his ideas. And while it's not the only reading, I think it is a dramatically poignant allegory of what it was like to be queer at the time, to be blocked from expressing who you are. When's it my turn? Incredible composition, framing her as being trapped from what she so desperately desires. Allegory or not, it's a powerful moment of wanting to be complete, but missing a part of herself. Later on, she's drawn to a ship and its fireworks display, and that's when she meets Eric. When a storm causes the ship to burn, Ariel saves the prince's life, which is how she then meets him. Eric is merely the embodiment of a motivation she already has, a crystallization of everything she's yearned for. Honestly, I don't even know how else to argue this point because it seems so self-evident what this conflict is about. This reading... Do not give your voice up for a man. ...is just not supported by the film. Ariel wants to know what it's like to be human. She wishes to be, has to be, part of that world. But there's a powerful obstacle in her way. Ursula is often pointed to as the villain of the movie, and in one sense, she is. She has nothing but malevolence in her actions. She's a villain, but she's not the antagonist. The real antagonist of this movie, the one who most directly opposes Ariel's goal, is her father, King Triton. And when he hears about her encounter with the human prince, he is livid. Finding her hidden grotto, he begins to chastise her harshly, furious again with her obsession. But then she crosses a line. Daddy, I love him! No! I am going to get through to you! And if this is the only way, so be it! This scene is, frankly, terrifying. The dramatic shadows and lighting frame this as a truly terrible action. I remember watching this as a kid and actually being distraught and scared. It's a very powerful moment, a turning point for the entire film. And here's the thing, even as Triton leaves, he immediately begins to show regret for what he's done. But he does leave. Ariel still sobbing at everything she loves being violently ripped away from her. And right at her most vulnerable point, Ursula makes her move. We represent someone who can help you. Someone who can make all your dreams come true. And this builds the real message of the movie. King Triton's attitude and behavior towards Ariel are wrong and are about to have drastic consequences. He thinks that being harsh and terrible will scare her straight. Instead, they've done nothing to quash her desires, and they've only served to drive her away and towards people who don't have her best interests at heart. Because keep in mind, the whole you have to kiss Eric in three days thing to stay human clause, giving up her family, that's Ursula's condition. If I become human, I'll never be with my father or sisters again. Ursula is the one who says that Ariel is better off without her voice. You know, Ursula, the villain who is evil and wrong. Yes, on land it's much preferred for ladies not to say a word, and after all, dear, what is idle prattle for? Ariel has to make Eric fall in love with her before the third sunset, a difficult task made even harder without her voice. It is a deal fit for only the very stupid or the very desperate. But Ariel is just that desperate. This deal is her only chance to see the human world, no matter how slight that chance is. And so, she signs her soul over to Ursula. After her transformation, Ariel washes up on shore, and Sebastian is terrified by what's just happened. But there's still a way out. Triton is the king of the ocean. He can undo this. Surely he can get Ursula to back down. Yet, looking at Ariel, 
he sees why that's not an option. Just be... Just be miserable for the rest of your life. He's starting to realize that he underestimated just how much this meant to Ariel. So, he decides to help her along with the plan. At about this point, Eric shows up to find her. He has been smitten with the girl with the angelic voice who saved him before. And while Ariel fits the physical description, her inability to vocalize makes him think that she can't possibly be the same person. But something remarkable begins to happen. He invites Ariel to stay at his castle anyways, and as they spend time together, they begin to grow closer. And what is it that brings them together? Not Ariel's looks, not her pretty face, not even her body language, but her zeal for all things human. Her eccentricities are odd to Eric, but he seems delighted by them. Her excitement is infectious as she gets the chance to explore the human world, and it's every bit as magical as she'd hoped it would be. It's her love of life that draws him in. That's beautiful. And for a moment, it seems like true love's kiss is about to really happen, but Ursula intervenes. Because this isn't a fair deal. It was never meant to be. Yet despite Ursula's best efforts to stack the cards in her favor, true love is actually managing to squirm through her net. So she decides to step things up a notch, using Ariel's voice to enchant Eric and thus doom the mermaid. As all this unfolds, Triton has had people combing the oceans for Ariel, unable to find her because, well, she ain't down there. She's up here. And we hear him despair with regret. Oh, what have I done? What have I done? He realizes that he went way, way too far. But he doesn't know yet just how far the situation has spiraled. Anyways, Ariel and her friends realize that the woman who quote-unquote won over Eric is Ursula. So a whole bunch of wacky shenanigans ensue. The voice shell shatters, and Ariel gets her voice back. The spell over Eric breaks, and he realizes that she really was the girl he's been looking for all along. But they realize, just a second too late. Oh, you're too late! Ursula now has Ariel in the palm of her hand. And it's at this point that her true machinations are laid out. She's got Ariel trapped, nothing can change that. Unless, King Triton is willing to trade himself. And Triton, well, he can't bear to see his daughter become just another wretched bauble in the Sea Witch's collection. His rage towards Ariel before had been a grave error, and left Ariel vulnerable to being exploited by a cruel force. Now the only way to save her is to sacrifice himself even if it means that the witch can take command of the Seven Seas. But that's exactly what he does, because in the end, he really does love Ariel. And so the reign of Ursula begins, and one of the first things she does is get attacked by Ariel. Again, her character has stayed constant through the movie. It might seem incredibly dumb to attack, you know, the new god queen of the ocean, but the moment she sees Eric is in danger, Ariel reacts and actually manages to save his life. And so it's fitting a few moments later when he returns the favor and slays Ursula. Wow, short reign. But that's the thing, Eric put his own life on the line to save Ariel, to save Triton, to save the entire undersea kingdom. And that, combined with everything Ariel risked to get to this point, leads to a powerful moment. You see, Ariel might be the protagonist and the titular character, but it's Triton who grows and changes the most. Through his daughter's actions, he's come to see that he was wrong about Ariel, about humans. Then I guess there's just one problem left. And what's that, your majesty? How much I'm going to miss her. And he finally gives her just what she wanted, this time with no strings attached. She can live her dreams because Triton now chooses to support her. The message of the movie isn't give up your voice for a man. So, why did Kira Knightley say it was? Especially on a press tour to promote a Disney movie, where I'm sure the Walt Disney Company very carefully crafted what would be asked and what would be said. Well, it's simple. They want to throw their old animated classics under the bus, so we'll buy tickets and merchandise for the new, better, more socially conscious live-action Little Mermaid. Watch, there's going to be a bit in the live-action version where Ariel looks directly at the camera and says, But Ursula, 
I won't give up my voice for a man. It's easier to sell that if you try to paint this as problematic. But the reading Knightley gave is just not supported by anything in the text of this movie. The message is about letting kids be free to grow, to pursue things their parents might not fully understand. It's about choosing to help them find healthy and safe ways to explore. It's a great message, a timeless message, wrapped in a movie that's filled to the brim with heart and beauty. And no one can ever convince me The Little Mermaid is anything less than an amazing film.